Bismillah, walhamdulillah. And Allah's mercy and blessings be upon His messengers. We do not make any difference amongst any of them. My sisters and my brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is your brother Abdus Salam. In this series of talks, I will answer the question of if the Quran by itself was enough, then how did we learn how to pray? Because every time I enter into a conversation or a debate with somebody over some issues where they only mention Allah's Messenger said it's sunnah to do this, it's sunnah to do that, I always ask them, but Allah doesn't say that in the Quran. Or I tell them in different ways, what you are saying is based on hadiths and hadiths only, and these hadiths were collected 300 years after the death of Rasulullah. So how can you use something like that when Allah didn't say about it in the Quran? I'm always and always faced with one argument or one question behind which that question, the answer will bear other elements. Because if I cannot answer this question, then I will need to accept anything that comes after that question. The question is, if the Quran by itself was enough, then how did we learn how to pray? They ask this question because they expect me to say, oh, I don't know. Then they say, you see, we need the hadith to tell us how to pray. And for that, the same thing for everything else. You see, they tell me that the Quran doesn't tell us when the rak'ah starts and when it finishes. The Quran doesn't tell us what to say, for example, in at tashahud it doesn't tell me when, uh, how I should start my salat, Allahu Akbar, the takbir, and how we should end the salat. Assalamu alaikum, these do not exist in the Quran. It doesn't tell us how many rak'ah is in each salat. For example, the Quran doesn't tell us that Maghrib is three rak'at and Fajr is two and Isha is four. Actually, what they are saying and the very basics of it, is if we follow the Qur'an alone, we wouldn't know how to pray. Since in their views, the Qur'an doesn't have any instruction on how we pray. Is this correct? Of course it's not. Now, if what they say is true, that the Qur'an is not, can, by itself cannot stand, then the Qur'an cannot be referred to as a book of guidance, either for us the believers or for other people for that matter, and would put Allah in a very difficult position. Because Allah in so many parts in Al-Qur'an has made many, many big claims in the Qur'an about the authority and supreme dominance of the Qur'an in Islam. Just as He made the Qur'an a supreme dominance over the Jewish Torah and the Christian Gospel. You see, every Muslim out there, when we talk to Jews and Christians, we always tell them the Quran is on top of the Torah and the Gospel. It's the last book that came after that. Meaning, for the Jews and Christians, they should follow the Quran because in the Quran is the final word of what Allah wants and it's not the Torah and it's not the Gospel. But that doesn't apply. Once a Jew becomes a Muslim, we tell them, by the way, you know what? You must add the Hadith because without the Hadith, the Quran is incomplete. And that puts Allah in a very difficult position. Because on one hand, in the Quran, it says it's only the Quran that takes over the Torah and the Gospel. And on the other hand, once somebody becomes a Muslim, we add a hadith to it. And by all means, they can turn, your Allah has deceived me. He tricked me. At one point, he said it's only the Quran, and now it no longer is the Quran alone. It just doesn't make sense that Allah makes the Quran rule over the Torah and the Gospel, and any other book for that matter. Okay, for, for example, Ibrahim and Dawood and all the other people. And then once these people come to Islam, they get added Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, the Tirmidhi, Nasai, Al-Hakim, and, and the endless numbers of other hadiths. As I mentioned, Allah made many big claims in the Quran about the authority and dominance of the Quran. Let us take a couple looks at the few ayat in the Quran. And believe me, they are in the hundreds. But I'm just going to pick about six or seven of them so that you understand that Allah takes His Quran, His word, His holy word, very, very seriously. 
And because in the way the Muslim majority today thinks, is they think that if the Quran by itself is not enough, how did we learn how to pray? It actually is an attack in what Allah claims. You see, in Al-Quran there are three types of claims. Claims that have passed. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sole creator of the universe. And he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. Nobody has ever come and said, you know what? I can create, I'm the creator of heaven and earth. Because the simplicity of it will tell them, go ahead, create another heaven and earth. Nobody can. But Allah says, I created. And that's the end of it. Allah demolished and punished Ad and Thamud. Allah made Fir'aun drown. All these are claims, historical claims made by Allah. No one has come to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about that. There are claims that shall come. For example, the end of the world, the accountability on judgment day, paradise, hellfire, and all these will come to pass and they will happen. And these are claims made by Allah. He told us in Al-Quran how they're going to happen and they will happen. And Allah then made the third claim about certain things. And I am not going to speak about them. I'm just going to speak about the Qur'an. Such as the authenticity of the Qur'an. Allah made claims about this in the Qur'an. The authority of the Qur'an. Allah made claims about this in the Qur'an. The uniqueness of the Qur'an as the law. Allah made claims about this in the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the only guide that will lead us to Allah. The Qur'an is the only guide that will lead us to the straight path that leads to Allah. That is the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I will mention here a few claims that Allah made about the might and power and authority, total leadership of the Qur'an. Just like Allah doesn't accept anyone to be associated to Him. He also does not accept any other law to be associated to what he says. If Allah has forbidden fornication, Allah will not accept that somebody else will come and make fornication halal. It just doesn't go with what Allah. So if somebody comes to Allah on Judgment Day and says, oh, X, Y, Z said that fornication is halal, Allah says, I said that in the Quran and my authority rules. So Allah does not accept somebody like Jesus, for example, to be made a son of God. He also does not accept that somebody else brings a law that contradicts the Quran and makes it a law. So let us look at the first claim that Allah made. And this is at the very beginning of the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah in the ayah number 2 where Allah says The book, i.e. the Quran that we have with us today without any shadow of doubt فِيهِ هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ In it is a guidance for the godly, for the pious people. Since Allah didn't mention any other thing with the Qur'an, the Qur'an by itself is the book of the guidance to the muttaqin, to those who fear Allah, to the godly people, to the pious people. If the hadith of the sunnah was part of this guidance, then Allah would have said, those books in front with you are guidance. But Allah, no. Allah speaks about the Qur'an and the Qur'an and He says, no shadow of doubt about this. See, when they added other things to the Qur'an, they made this ayah invalid. Because Allah speaks about one book, the Qur'an, but they made Islam so many books. So this is one claim. And the Qur'an, by, by the way, is a book authored by Allah. It's Allah who spoke it, Allah who decided how it is designed, what should go into it, what shouldn't go into it, and it should be accepted as Allah intended, not as we intend. That's why Allah makes somebody consider someone as a disbeliever. Do you believe in part of the kitab, the book, and you disbelieve in the other part? Allah Allah considers anyone who takes part of the Qur'an as they like and rejects other parts of the Qur'an as they dislike as disbelievers. So you really, really want to be extremely cautious about this point here. Claim number two. Allah says, هذا, this, this, the Qur'an. So Allah is going to introduce to us what the Qur'an for Allah means. He says, هذا بيان للناس. This, the Qur'an is a بيان للناس. In other, in the sites where they translate this بيان, they say it's a plain statement for mankind. It's an 
evidence for mankind, a plain exposition for, for people, a clear lesson to people, a declaration for mankind, a clear statement to all the people. But the, uh, the, the meaning that I consider and I feel is closer to what Allah wants is a clarification to people. Because in Arabic, bayyana is to clarify something to somebody else. So Allah says, this Quran, this book, hadha bayanul linas, is a clarification to people. And then he adds, wahudan, i.e. the Quran is a guidance. وَمَوْعِظَةٌ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ and a warning advice for the godly pious so the Quran is a book of clarification clarifies what? what's halal and what's haram as we shall see in a little bit later and is a guidance to both the pious and to people who are don't know who God is we give them the Quran it will lead them to Allah just like when we read the Quran it will lead us to what Allah wants the halal and the haram of it and also is a warning advice for us against what we are going to expect on judgment day claim number three that Allah made Inna anzalna Torah. Surely we have sent down the Torah, the Torah that is the book that was sent down to Musa السلام, to the Jews. Fiha hudan wa nur. In the Torah until our days today, there is a guidance and light in it. Couple ayat later. And this was revealed in Surah Al-Ma'idah. Surah Al-Ma'idah is the last of the very last Qur'an that was revealed. Ninety days after the revelation of this Surah, the Messenger died. It kind of like it summarizes what Allah wants from us. And that's why in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah calls upon the believers 14 times. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. Subhanallah, it's, it's, uh, one day inshallah we'll discuss this Surah. It's incredible. So here Allah is telling us in the last, at the end, in the last three months of, in the life of the messenger, Allah tells us that he has sent down a Torah and in it is guidance and light. Couple ayat later in Surah Al-Ma'idah in ayah 46, Allah speaks the same thing about the gospel that he sent to Jesus. He says, وَآتَيْنَاهُ injil," And we granted him, i.e. to Jesus, the gospel. فِيهِ هُدًا وَنُورِ In it, i.e. the gospel, is guidance and light. Today, I, I hear this a lot. Christians in Egypt and Jewish, the Arabic-speaking Jewish, they say, look what your God is saying about the Torah and the gospel. He says there is guidance in them and light. And yes, there is guidance and light in them, but in the original texts, not what has been translated, because what's translated today into English is not the Bible. It's the translation from Latin, and Latin itself was translated from the Aramaic and from the Hebrew. So it's, it's so many translations upon translations upon, upon translations. So we cannot say the translated Bible or the Gospel is the saying of Allah just like we cannot say that the translated Hadith is what the Messenger say because even the Arabic is not what the Messenger of Allah said. So this is uh, something to bear in mind. So when Allah is talking about the Gospel and the Torah, He's talking about the text that He sent in the languages He sent down, not the the translation. So Allah talks about the Torah and the Gospel and the Injil that both of them are guidance and light. Guess what? Allah designs the same thing and defines the Quran with the same terms. He's already said it's Hudan, so the Hidayah, the guidance is an Quran. Then Allah in another ayah in Surah at taghabun that's the Surah number 68, the ayah number 8, Allah is, is pushing us and he says, so believe in Allah, فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ So believe in Allah and in His Messenger. وَالنُّورِ الَّذِي أَنزَلْنَا And in the light we descended to Him. The light here is the Quran. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed on the Quran what is extremely, it's, it's incredible, the challenge that Allah said to mankind in the Quran. Allah says, they want to extinguish the light of Allah. The light of Allah here is the Quran, i.e. 
people that don't believe or they don't want the Quran to, 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 to become in power, just like it's happening today, the Crown Prince Saudi Arabia, the Emirates and Egypt and all these countries, the Muslim countries, they don't want the Quran to become the authority. So they want to extinguish the light, the Quran of Allah, be afwahim with their mouths and the hint here in the mouths. Because the Quran can only be contradicted with words. Allah says, a human say. In another ayah, my dear sisters and my brothers, Allah explicitly expresses that it is with the Quran and the Quran alone that humans can be taken out from darknesses and into light. Which light are we talking about? The Quran. Anything away from the Quran is darkness, regardless of how good humans think that is. Allah speaking to his messenger Muhammad tells him something extremely important and we should pay attention to what Allah says. Allah takes it very seriously and on judgment day when Allah asks us we're not going to tell him oh, oh you know what I really didn't know I didn't think you were serious about it. Everything that is in the Quran is a serious point as long as as far as Allah is concerned. Listen to what Allah says to his messenger. Kitabun, a book which book is this? The Torah? The Gospel? He's talking to Muhammad. He's talking to him about the Quran. So when Allah says, Kitabun, Allah is mentioning the Quran. Anzalnahu ilayka. We sent it down to you. لتخرج الناس To exit people. To take them out. To take people out. من الظلمات From darknesses. إلى النور Into light. Subhanallah, from the darknesses, i.e. anything that is not in the Qur'an and is followed, is a darkness. And anything that is in the Qur'an and is followed is light. If guidance and the rituals of Islam were also in the hadith, then Allah should have said to Prophet Muhammad that those books we reveal to you, and with that we have the Quran and all the other books. But no, Allah chose this book, هذا الكتاب كتاب. My dear sisters and my brothers, it's not this ayah, one ayah, and it's not ten, it's not hundred, and it's not five hundred ayat. The amount of the ayat in the Quran which speak how much Allah praises the Quran, how Allah puts this Quran in an incredible position. It's almost in each of the six thousand ayats that speak the glory and magnificence of Allah's Qur'an. But somewhere somebody had decided that the Qur'an by itself wasn't enough. And here we are today, the majority of Muslims around the world and for the last 1400 years aren't aware of the exclusivity of the Qur'an in Islam. Someone might ask the question, what, for the last 1400 years no scholar has ever paid attention to this except you? Well, I say no, because for the last 1400 years, the huge 99% of the Muslim population were ignorant people. They solely relied on what is told to them. Even today, you find a PhD doctor in physics. He still relies on a sheikh to tell him what's halal and what's haram. He can't derive what's halal and what's haram from the Qur'an even though Allah said وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ We have made the Qur'an easy to study, easy to learn, easy to derive Allah's laws from them. All you need is فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ Is there somebody to study the Qur'an to derive? No. And the, the, the conspiracy, I really call it the conspiracy, carries on. So much so until they brought Al-Bukhari and they say it's the most authentic book after the Qur'an. And with time, Al-Bukhari is authentic book along with the Qur'an and in some instances above the Qur'an. It's, it's extremely, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I don't know how to express it. And here comes the third claim, my dear sisters and brothers. And with this one, you will have a better idea of what Allah also means. Because Allah takes... Uh, Allah takes his Quran extremely, extremely, extremely serious. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ جِئْنَاهُمْ بِكِتَابٍ And we indeed have come up to them with a book, i.e. the Quran. فَصَّلْنَاهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ Which we minutely detailed with knowledge.
And this is extremely important. What Allah is saying is, the Quran has been authored with precision and full knowledge based on what Allah Ta'ala knows about us humans. Allah took, uh, took two elements when authoring the Quran. Allah took us the human, our abilities, our journey on earth, our special, spiritual and emotional needs, our physical needs. And then he provided for us all we need, both for this life and in the hereafter in the Quran. Allah never ever asked us to grow wings and fly we cannot we are not equipped with that and that's why on judgment day allah is not gonna ask us why we didn't fly yet allah equipped us with a brain and we invented the planes and we're flying in disguise allah is not gonna come on judgment day and he's gonna tell us why did you fly in disguise because the very beginning for the wings he did not equip us he did not give us the ability to fly with wings but on the second one he gave us a brain and he told us to use the brain and he led us to fly just like he led uh, Nuh to build the ark and just float on it so th these are Allah is, see Allah is an expert in taking this into consideration and the second element is he tailored the Quran to fit those needs those human needs Allah specifically used the word fasalda a tafsil or tailoring is say you want to get married or your sister or someone wants to tailor a suit you go to a tailor you take a piece of clothing and you ask the tailor to design a dress or a suit for you what is what's the tailor gonna do he's gonna take a measurement and then he will design a suit for you Allah Allah spoke of the Quran that he tailored it for humanity. Imagine we, <laughs> the Quran, a piece of clothes, Allah is going to make a dress for us. That dress is going to take us from the darknesses into light. The only book that Allah spoke of like that is the Quran. Not the Hadith, not Bukhari, not Muslim, not what the scholars say. Not, 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 not. Only the Quran. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exactly did based on how previous human behaviors with his books, the Torah, the Injil and everything, Allah designed the Quran, he changed laws, he added laws, he upgraded laws, he downgraded uh, laws so that people, humanity can be better because we humans, like children, we keep growing. And knowing the nature of the upcoming generations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ensured that the Qur'an responds to all of our needs. This is why Allah says that the Qur'an is also a hudan, it's a guidance. So the Qur'an has been minutely detailed with knowledge and Allah made this Qur'an, this minutely detailed book, a guidance. And whoever follows the Quran will reach وَرَحْمَةً لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ And a mercy for people who believe. And then for the people who do not take the books of Allah, specifically we Muslims, you're talking about the Quran, who don't take the Quran seriously, Allah says, ask them a question. هَلْ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَّا تَأْوِيلَهُ do they wait for the fulfillment of its warnings, i.e. the punishment promised by the Qur'an, by Allah in the Qur'an? Then Allah says, يَوْمَ يَأْتِ تَأْوِيلُهُ The day the Qur'an's prophecies become real, on that day, يَقُولُ الَّذِينَ نَسُوهُ مِنْ قَبْلُ Those who had pushed the Qur'an behind them, who ignored it, they will say on that day The messengers of our Lord did indeed come with the truth Yes, the messengers Because the Quran is the summary of all books that all messengers came with It's personified in Al-Quran And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, on what people will say on Judgment Day, Are they any intercessors, any saviors that might intercede, that, made, that might save us? Of course the Jews will speak about uh, Musa, the, 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 the Christians will speak about Jesus, we will speak about, each people will speak about their messenger, but for us, the Muslims, the believers, those people who on Judgment Day, you see, on judgment day, the messenger of Allah will hold the Qur'an in one hand. And this is the only time that the messenger of Allah will speak with freely. And then he will be called to witness.
There is no intercession and there is no of that thing like the Prophet Muhammad becomes a second player on Judgment Day. Put this one in her fire when Allah says, oh, put this one in her fire, the Prophet Muhammad comes and goes, no, please don't do that, please. And then Allah says, okay, don't put him in her fire. It doesn't happen like this. The Quran doesn't say this. This is what the Hadith says. This is what other people say. The Quran doesn't say, doesn't the Quran say in Al-Fatiha that Allah is the king, is the owner of Judgment Day? He decides, yeah, the king, he decides, he doesn't need, he doesn't take any any input from somebody else but what is going to happen is the Prophet Muhammad on judgment day will hold the Quran in one hand and we Muslims we will stand on the other hand on the other side and he will point at us and he will say Ya Rabbi my Lord Inna qawmi, my people and pointing at us ittakhadu. they have deliberately taken this Quran had al Quran this Quran then he points to the Quran mahjuran not only did we abandon the Quran we doing everything in our capacity to not listen to the Quran to abandon the Quran and this is the only time where the messenger is going to speak and he's gonna witness against that and that's why Allah is threatening us anyone who doesn't follow the Quran today is not taking the Quran seriously today and expects on judgment day to have it easy ain't gonna happen so on that day Allah says those who will say on judgment day those who have pushed the Quran ignored it and everything the messengers of our Lord did indeed come with the truth can we have intercessors saviors that can help us save us or that we might be returned to life فَنَعْمَلْ غَيْرَ الَّذِي كُنَّا نَعْمَلْ So that we do other than what we used to do, that we used to act. And then Allah issues the ruling on them. قَدْ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ They have lost their own selves. وَضَلَّ عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَفْتَرُونَ And all that which they used to invent in this life will fully abandon them. Do you think Al-Bukhari will come on judgment today and say, Ya Allah, uh, uh, I wrote the Al-Bukhari based on the revelation. Al-Bukhari on judgment day will run away and he will say, I'm innocent. I never said what, it's them who made me. I never said this and that, my dear sisters. The dangers are great. Now I go to the fourth claim. Allah speak in again to, to disbelievers and to ask within them. أَفَغَيْرَ اللَّهِ أَبْتَغِي حَكَمًا And this is all also the messenger speaking. Is it other than Allah I should seek as a legislator? Yes, it's Allah who legislates. While he is the one who has أنزل إليكم الكتاب مفصلا who has descended for you the book i.e. the Quran perfectly detailed. Ya Rabbi What do we want for more than this? Allah has sent down the Quran perfectly detailed in the Quran. Allah who has what he wants from us. Subhanallah. In Surah An-Nur for example, yeah, just to give you an example, yeah. We, we, we always are told that we should all eat from the same place. There is barakah in this and there is that, right? Nonsense, because Allah in the Quran he says, "Laysa alaykum juna." There is absolutely no blame on you. Either you eat together or separate. So the Quran gives us the option: eat alone, eat together. But the Sunnah, as they say, the Hadith tells you, no. If you eat separate, Shaitan is on you. If you eat together, you are united. Complete nonsense. And this is just one example of millions of examples how the Sunnah contradicts the Quran and people today follow. Qala Rasulullah, the Messenger of Allah said, it is Sunnah as opposed to Allah said, the Quran says. Take me to the fifth claim. And here it is. And this one is about Allah's one order to his messenger for the rest and entire life of that messenger. As long as he lives, Prophet Muhammad was only commanded one thing as when it comes to the Quran. Ittabi'a. Closely follow. Ma uhiya ilayka min rabbik. What has been revealed to you? from your Lord. Prophet Muhammad is the first man to be a Qur'ani, to be a man who believes in the Qur'an. Because all his life, what did Muhammad follow? He followed the Qur'an. He didn't follow his own sunnah. It's impossible. He followed the Qur'an. 
And Allah says, La ilaha illahu, there is no deity except Him. And since there is no deity except Allah, the only one to issue commands in this religion is Allah. And then Allah commands His Messenger, He goes, وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And turn away from those mushriks, those who join other gods with Him. Meaning, had the Messenger followed anything else but Al-Qur'an, what Allah revealed to him, in the sight of Allah, he would be considered as a mushrik, as an associator to Allah. You know what this means, my dear sisters and my brothers? Anyone who follows any other laws, not in Al-Qur'an, is a mushrik. Full stop. So look at you today, when I tell you the Qur'an, you tell me, no, the Qur'an cannot do this. So you spend all your energy in telling me that the Qur'an by itself cannot drive Islam? It is, it is an incredible, and you will see at the end of this talk that Allah did tell us how to pray, that Allah did explain in details how we perform a salat, that Al-Quran did not let us down, but it is the ignorance of people who has let us down. Of now to the next claim, to the sixth and seventh, these next two claims are extremely dangerous claims because they really, really, really would make Al-Quran completely a book of nothing and then we might as well become Jews and Christians because if the next two ayat cannot be upheld then we have a huge problem because Allah states in the sixth claim وَمَا كَانَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ and this Qur'an was never to have been produced without Allah وَمَا كَانَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنُ أَنْ يُفْتَرَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ the Qur'an could never ever have been made minutely detailed and produced without Allah. And then he says, وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ But it is a confirmation of what is present between its hands. In other words, the Qur'an is a proof. You see, when Prophet Muhammad came to people and he says, I'm a messenger, people say, well, what makes you a messenger? What's your evidence? What's that? The Qur'an came to prove that Muhammad was a messenger. It's not the other way around. It's the Qur'an that proves, that gives Muhammad an authority over people to act as Allah's messenger. And then Allah adds, وَتَفْصِيلَ الْكِتَابِ And the detailing of the book, the Qur'an, who, who, who has the ability, the capacity to explain the Qur'an, to say, to detail the Qur'an so that we follow it precisely as he wants? Allah says, لا ريب فيه is without a shadow of doubt من رب العالمين from the Lord of all words. So I want you to pay attention to this ayah. وتفصيل الكتاب and the detailing of the book is without a shadow of doubt from the Lord of all words. I will again say it one more time. And the detailing of the book, i.e. the Qur'an, is without a shadow of doubt from the Lord of the worlds. And this is in Surah Yunus, that's Surah number 10, the Ayah 37. In other words, the one who has detailed the Qur'an is Allah. This is why it is impossible for the Prophet Muhammad to have added to Allah's religion. How could the Sunnah explain the Qur'an when Allah says that the Qur'an has been detailed by Allah Himself? I don't know how we can explain this. Because once I say, oh, the Qur'an by itself is not enough, then all the, the claims that I have mentioned here cannot stand. And as I said, I'm just mentioning seven. I could have mentioned 700 of them. Or lie easily, without any shadow of, uh, like, oh my God, it's too much. Or where am I going to find the next ayah? It's, it's ayah after ayah after ayah after ayah after ayah after ayah. Let me take you to the seventh claim so can we, we can proceed. As I said in the previous six ayah that I mentioned before, Allah praised the Qur'an and at one point He even said that this book has been explained and detailed expertly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in the next ayah that I'm going to mention here, Allah puts His self, His holy self, and His Qur'an in the same equation. And as such, the fall of the Qur'an would inherently and imminently mean the fall of Allah Himself. It's like you say to somebody, my word, my word is my bond. 
I, if my word gets broken, I get broken. So Allah is telling us, the Qur'an is my bond. If the Qur'an is not enough, then I am not enough. If the Qur'an is not sufficient, then I haven't done a good job. And here is what Allah says in the Qur'an. Kitabun, he goes back again to Kitabun, a book, and here he refers to Al-Qur'an. Uhkimat ayatu, which ayat have been well perfected. ثُمَّ فُصِّلَتْ مِنْ لَدٌ Then detailed from the one who is an absolute manager, حكيم خبير an absolute manager, fully acquainted with all things. This is uh, Surah Hud, Surah number 11, Ayah 1. I repeat, a book which ayat have been well perfected, then detailed from the one who is an absolute manager, fully acquainted. And then, ha, what do we expect from this? Allah authored the Qur'an and detailed it to respond to the needs of everyone that comes in contact with it. But the believers today in the Qur'an are challenging Allah by making such statements as if the Qur'an by itself was enough, how did we then learn how to pray? Subhanallah, it's, it's incredible. Uh, it's, it, and then they tell you, read in the Quran one letter, you get ten rewards, and you get this. Uh, and then they ask these questions. It just doesn't go. It's incredible. My dear sisters and my brothers, I believe the seven ayat from Allah's Quran that I mentioned here should be more than enough to give you an idea how serious Allah takes the Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the book, i.e. the Quran, contain all what Allah wants from us. And Allah put a huge emphasis on the Quran being the de facto driving force behind Islam and none else. Now I want to go back to our points. And answer the following question. If the Quran by itself was not enough, now how did we learn how to pray? As I have already said, my dear sister and my brothers, if the Quran cannot tell us how to pray, then we might as well become Jews and Christian. At least these two are denominations from the Abrahamic religion, and they don't have the, the Torah and the Sunnah of Moses and the Sunnah of Jesus and the Sunnah of this and the Sunnah of that, and that's it. We live in dangerous times and we live in a very, very dangerous times and such situation where people ask you the question, uh, if Allah, uh, if the Quran is enough by itself, how can we learn to pray and things like that? It's, it's incredible. This situation is beyond incredible. Today when someone tells you something about Allah's religion, for example, they tell you taking flower to a sick person is haram. Subhanallah, somebody is sick in the hospital, you go visit them, what are you going to take them? Orange juice? Uh, sugar? Uh, a piece of bread? People usually take flowers, and flowers when people go there, you have bunches of flowers, and it gives you a nice view, a nice place, the, the room becomes all full of flowers, and it adds colors, it adds nature, it adds a lot of beautiful things and that. But in our Salafi world, taking flowers to a sick person is not permitted, it is haram, a strange thing as it might seem. It is haram. So when non-Muslims hear this, they don't think, they don't know of Bukhari and Muslim. They know about the Quran. They go, wow, God in the Quran is extremely rude. Flowers are nice and blah, blah, blah. You, you think I'm joking about this, right? Well, I'm not. Here is what one sheikh from the High Council of Islamic Affairs and Fatwas in Saudi Arabia. He is the, this is the highest authority uh, in Saudi Arabia, the Wahhabi state. Right, uh, this man's name is Salah Al Fawzan. Salah Al Fawzan was asked in an audio tape about someone sick, and we take flowers to him. What is the ruling of Islam on this? I want you to listen to this, and I'm gonna read the Arabic and English as usual so that you get the right translation of the thing. He says, لا, لا, هذا, هذا لا, No, no, this is done by some people, the ignorant. No, i.e., the flowers shouldn't be given to him. يقدم له الدعاء بالشفاء والعافية. But rather should present him with dua for cure and serenity. He should give him ruqya, i.e. recite some dua or some Qur'an on the sick part of the person. But as for the roses and flowers, those won't be of 
any benefit to the sick, none at all. وَهُوَ مِنَ الْعَادَاتِ السَّيِّئَةِ In fact, this is from the evil customs and habits. And now comes the extreme more dangerous than what he already said. And he said, وَبَعْدَ الْإِنسَانِ يَعْتَقَدْ فِيهِ هَذَا شَرٍ بَعْدَ Also, there is another evil that is the evil of belief. And what he's saying is, when people believe that flowers can bring a cure, can bring a heal to the person, and he goes, this is extremely dangerous. شَرٌ فِي الْعَقِيدَةِ Then he carries on saying, it is a harmful evil in the aqidah, in the creed. And this is photo of Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan. Salih Al-Fawzan, who is, as I said, the high member of the High Council of Islamic Affairs and Fatwas in Saudi Arabia and uh, etc. So according to Al-Fawzan, we shouldn't take flowers. It's haram. It's an evil custom. Worse, if you believe that flowers can cure, then you are mushrik because it attacks your creed. And uh, usually when this al Fawzan is presented in his talks, Wallah, you get shivers down your spine. He's already sitting on a lofty chair. It's almost like a king he's sitting on there. And uh, very praiseful, each question has got a line of praises before it. They put him on the highest pedestal. It's, 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 it's incredible to the extent where they call him Al-Walid. Al-Walid is your biological father. So when, when I ask him a question, I go, Oh, qal Al-Walid. It's like he gave me birth to me, which is a lie. And these people are lying right there and then, right in front of him, by calling him Al-Walid, when he knows he is not their dad, he's not their biological dad. Sometimes they would call him His High Excellency, Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan, or His Highness. Uh, someone I heard it on a tape, and Al-Fawzan was sitting there, and the guy said it, and he didn't object it. He said, Al-Fawzan is a slip of time. He is a living companion among us. Wallahi, this is a calamity. And then he tells you taking flowers is an evil and it's shirk and things like that. My dear sisters and my brothers, if al Fawzan was there, all right, because when people hear this kind of fatwas, they will accept this as, as that say, without any resistance that what al Fawzan speaks is what Allah says in Al Quran and does that. But if you ask somebody, does Allah say anything about this matter in the Quran? then watch the other people jump right in front of you in a very defensive manner as if you ask them does Allah say anything about this in the Bible or the Torah or the Buddhist mantra does he say people today like in the last 1400 years have a suspicious attitude towards the Quran the moment you say what does Allah say in the Quran you become an enemy of Islam straight away they will call you a Qurani and what kind of Muslims are we today when we use the term Quran as an insult? Because when they say you are a Qurani, it's an insult. Yet they have no problem being called a Sunni. Today you say, oh, I am a Sunni as opposed to Shia. So I am Sunni. But they, it's praiseful. It's very good to be a Sunni. But once you bring the Quran in, you are a Qurani, which means you are an evil. My dear sisters and my brothers, we live in very dark days, very dark times. You see, today we live in the... Islam is the messenger of Allah said. So and so scholar or school of thought said. It is sunnah to do this or that. That's it. We eat according to the sunnah. We drink according to the sunnah. We sleep according to the sunnah. We marry according to the sunnah. We divorce according to the sunnah. And a thousand other things according to the sunnah. Yet you never hear them say it is Quranic to do this or that. We live in very awkward times where nobody wants to be called Qur'ani. In fact, the majority of sheikhs and school of thoughts use the term Qur'ani as a derogative, as a, to mean somebody is deviated and in most cases kafir. And I heard it with my ears a thousand times. And if I was given the opportunity to sit at the table with the biggest sheikh and debate the Qur'an, I'll win them hands down. Allah, I'll beat them. There is no problem in bringing the Quran forward. But because when they talk behind micro, uh, microphones and just television, you can't argue with them. And the general public, they don't know that these sheikhs 
are motivated by agendas, not by the book of Allah. And this is a great danger in which we live today. This talk I'm talking about today should never ever have taken place if we had prioritized the Quran for the last 1400 years. But uh, hopefully, inshallah, in the previous generations to come, they will listen to this kind of talks and it will propulse them, project them forward. My dear sisters and my brothers, there are two types of Islam. Okay, and there is a big difference between the Quranic Islam and the Hadithic Islam. There is an Islam which is built only upon the Quran, and another Islam built only on Hadith. I once was watching a debate on YouTube, and it's still on YouTube, where a Sheikh was given a talk about the two types of Islam. Then, when he was asked by his host, "What difference do both types have?" The Sheikh answered, in short, if we never ever spoke of the Qur'an again, the current Islam wouldn't suffer at all. However, if we only preach the Qur'an, the Qur'anic Islam, then the entire Sunni Islam not only will it change, but it will completely disappear and give space to the authority of the Qur'an. And this, neither governments nor their Islamic councils and ministries and school of thoughts and all those people are willing to let the Qur'an drive Islam. They don't want a total, complete new Islam on their hands. They want the old 1400 years backward Islam to still rule in the 21st century, 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. As far as I'm concerned, I am not returning. There is no going back for me, Abdul Salam, to the Salafism that I used to once drive in the West. I started giving talks back at the end of the 80s, 88, 89, when books in English did not exist. My talks used to be promoted, my tapes used to be promoted because I spoke English. And back then, there was a huge thirst about Islam in English. And it's sad that I helped push the Salafism, the Sunnah Islam. And I wish I had known better back then, but it's an experience and today it's helping me build this new appeal to bring the Qur'an forward. I am never ever going back to the Islam belt, as I said, upon hadith, to the Islam belt, upon the school of thoughts and argument between the sheikhs, to the endless battles about the authority of this or that hadith, which one is stronger than the other, to the endless fights justifying hadiths when they contradict each other, you get all kinds of mechanics, the sheikh mechanics to try to fix the hadith, to the clever takes it all approach, anyone who is clever in the argument they provide will win the argument to listening to the sheikhs that are accepted, promoted and pushed by kings only. If Ibn Uthaymin says what the kings want, Ibn Uthaymin is put in front of and he will preach the Islam that will make the kings and rulers at ease. Today there is an Islam that is being promoted by the Salafis where they and it's on YouTube, you, go, you can go there, and where he says, oh God, if the ruler, if the king of whoever is, gets every day, lifetime on a television, where he fornicates, he, he actually is having sex with a woman, naked, and drinks wine on television, we, the people, cannot revolt against him, and we should make dua for Allah to guide him. This is the kind of Islam they want, and this kind of Islam is not supported by the Qur'an. I want to tell you a story that Ibn Kathir reports in his book Al-Bidaya and Al-Nihaya, the beginning and the end, and in volume 7, when he talks about Al-Qadisiyah battle. The Qadisiyah battle is a battle that took place in the 15th year, the Hijri year, under the leadership of Omar against the Persian uh, Empire. And that's a battle that the Muslims won. And since then, the Persian Empire, which is today Iran, never ever really uh, took, uh, went back to power after that. Rabbi ibn Amr, this story is told, and it, it, it's told like to show the grandness and how big Muslims were and how proud and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, it, it acts on the other hand against uh, the, the Hadithic Islam. Ibn Kathir tells us the story. Okay, 
that Rabbi ibn Amr went to meet up with Rostam. Rostam being the supreme Persian general. He was the army commander, the high, like the minister of defense today or things like that. Okay. Rostam asks Rabbi ibn Amr, the companion, and he tells him, what brings you and your armies to us? That the Qadisiya battle was led by Sa'd ibn Abi al-Waqqas. Uh, 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 Allah forgive them all. But anyhow, Rostam asks Rabbi ibn Amr, uh, Amr, what brings you and your armies to us? Rabbi said, we are a people who have been sent out by Allah to save the humans from the worship of other humans and to the worship of Allah alone, the Lord of humans. And from the narrowness of this life to the vastness of the hereafter and from the operation of other religions to the justice of Islam. As I said, this incident took place under the leadership of Omar ibn al-Khattab. And this is extremely important because, you see, Omar ibn al-Khattab was the very first, at least what's documented, who believed that nothing should drive Islam except the Qur'an. And this is what he enforced in his life and before uh, uh, Abu Bakr and after him. That the Qur'an should only be the sole authority that drives Islam. That's why Rabbi ibn Amr, when he went and to meet Rustam, he didn't mention the Sunnah, he didn't mention the Prophet, he didn't mention anything. He just mentioned that we are a people that have been sent out by Allah to save the humans from the worship of humans, to the worship of Allah, Allah the Lord of the universe, from the narrowness of this life to the vastness of the hereafter, from the oppression of the other religions to the justice of Islam. And they understood Islam as belt on the Quran. As a matter of fact, as I said, Umar ibn al-Khattab was amongst the first to reject the hadith and the Prophet was alive. He was not dead. Listen up to this hadith that exists in Bukhari, Muslim and other books of hadith but is hidden because it doesn't serve and the Shia keep bang, the Shia know all these hadith but we don't because from us they are hidden. But here it is. And this hadith is called, is well known by hadith Yawm al the big catastrophe hadith. Ibn Abbas is the narrator of this hadith. And this hadith, as I said, is in Bukhari and Muslim and many other books, it's well known hadith. When Prophet Muhammad in the last days of his life was extremely sick, he asked the companions, bring me something that I can write for you. A proclamation after which you will not go astray. Bring me pen and paper or ink and paper and I will write something for you. He, he was going to write for them like his will. I want this and I want this and I want that. And if the people follow that, then they will never ever go astray and we would never ever have gone astray before uh, away from that. When uh, the messenger said that, Umar said something. He said, Inna Nabi ghalabahu al he said the Prophet is seriously ill and delirious, i.e. under the pain of the fever, he's just saying things and he's not paying attention. Why is he saying this? He, and then he says, وَعِنْدَنَا كِتَابُ اللَّهِ حَشْبُنَا And we have got Allah's book with us and that is sufficient for us. Umar understood that the Prophet Muhammad had no authority of saying anything because anything that was to be said was said in the Quran. What is Muhammad going to write? The, we don't need what Muhammad is going to write to us after uh, in his will. The Quran has already got everything. We don't need that. And that's why he said the Prophet is delirious. He's sick. He doesn't know what he is saying. And then the hadith carry on Abdullah carries on and he says, فاختلفوا. And the people deferred about that, وكثر اللغط. And the companions were disagreeing about this and there was a lot, a loud dispute because some of them, they say, oh, give him, let him write, let him write, let's see what he's going to write. And the others say, no, 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 we got the Quran, what is he going to write for us? You see, <laughs> this, this doesn't stand today. Today we push to believe in Bukhari, Muslim, and Hadith, and this, this, this. If Omar and the companions were alive today, they would burn all books except the Quran. When the messenger saw that what has happened, he told them, Qumu anni. Go, leave me all alone. وَلَا يَنْبَغِي عِنْدِ And it's not right that you quarrel in my presence.
And then Abdullah ibn Abbas came out saying, Inna al-raziyya, the kul al-raziyya, the catastrophe, the whole catastrophe is that which came between Allah's messenger and the right of his proclamation, i.e. Umar. Had Umar shut up, had Umar kept his mouth shut, then the messenger would have written something for us and we would have known what at least the messenger was thinking. Of course the Shia were saying, you know what? The Prophet was going to say that the one who was going to lead after me is Ali. That's what they say was going to happen. But since the messenger didn't try it, we would never know what exactly the Prophet wanted to say then. I'm coming up to the hour, so I'm going to stop here and then inshallah carry on in part two. Uh, again, this is your brother Abdul Salam and off to part two. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.